of Mubarak's trial, according to you? Uh, Mubarak's trial is more or less uh, a theater or a circus, not really a real trial. If you ask me, the verdict against Mubarak had already been issued in Tahrir Square during the uprising, which is honestly public execution. This is uh, a criminal, this is a thug, this is a dictator who ruled this country for the past 30 years using torture chambers and security services that were no different from the Gestapo. And if this was a real revolution, then Mubarak would have been facing justice by now. But now you are in a position where Mubarak is getting tried while his regime is still alive and well, while the judiciary has not been purged and still corrupt, while the army generals, his own loyal army generals, are still running the country. So the outcome of this trial will depend so much on our public pressure from below, on our protests to achieve justice, because if it was up to the generals, then Mubarak would not have stood trial in the first place. Um, up until now, uh, the only positive thing I see out of Mubarak's uh, trial is that, number one, um, everybody uh, in Egypt who has suffered under this dictatorship can now see this invincible dictator behind bars, weak, humiliated, and this is a message to any future leader of this country. Secondly, is that the image and the visuals of Mubarak and his corrupt sons and his corrupt police officers standing behind bars is definitely emboldening um, other Arab uh, uh, people in other Arab countries in order to step forward and also continue with the revolt. Uh, I recall well that I've been reading reports everywhere that as soon as Mubarak appeared on TV and he's facing justice, that uh, the Yemenis were thinking we can do the same to our dictator. The Syrians were watching and they were thinking we can do the same to Bashar. And I'm sure that the Moroccans are watching and they are saying we can do the same uh, to our king. So the significance of this trial is much more about its impact other than the trial itself. Speaking of uh, the generals, uh, what is your opinion towards the role that they are playing right now and their possible future role? The army had tried to pretend uh, that they were pro-revolution and that they protected the revolution. But we have no doubt whatsoever that those army generals, if they did have the chance, they would have fired on protesters, just like in Syria and just like in Libya. But they understood quite well that if they had opened fire on us in Tahrir Square, the army would have collapsed because we have two armies in Egypt, not one army. You have the generals, and the high-ranking officers, and then you have the conscripts and the young officers who were pro the revolution. And if you had given them the orders to open fire on their fellow Egyptians, the rank and file of the army would have broken down immediately. This does not mean that those generals are now sitting back and just watching what's happening. They are part of the counter-revolution. They are inciting against the revolutionaries in Tahrir and elsewhere. They have criminalized uh, strikes. They have criminalized uh, mass protests. They are summoning journalists to the military prosecutor and intimidating them. Torture continues on a mass scale, just like before the revolution. And you have more than 12,000 Egyptians who have been prosecuted in military tribunals uh, from January up until today. So for us, the revolution is still unfinished and we will continue until we overthrow those generals. I uh, would like to ask you, what is, what is the possible role of the net in the future of Egypt? And what do you see in the future in front of the upcoming elections also, of, of the future of your country? I mean, the, the role of the internet in this revolution has been largely uh, exaggerated by the media and by some of, in the activist community. Um, the revolution that happened uh, in Egypt uh, this January is more or less um, like the climax uh, of a process that has been happening in the years before on the ground, not in the cyberspace. They started with the 2000 uh, mass protests against Mubarak in solidarity with the Palestinian Intifada, which turned into a strong mass anti-war movement when the Americans invaded Iraq in 2003. And this was only to evolve into a strong anti-Mubarak movement that was dubbed Kifaya or Enough. 
And later, with the labor strikes breaking out in December 2006 in Mahalla and in elsewhere around the country, this strike wave continued with us and we credited with the revolution later. And let's remember that um, at the end of the day, what brought down uh, Mubarak were the labor strikes in the last four days of the uprising, not necessarily us in Tahrir. Internet will continue to play a role as uh, a medium where we can disseminate information to both fellow Egyptians and to journalists and activists abroad so that they can extend solidarity with us back home. Uh, they will definitely play a role in monitoring political life uh, uh, overall in Egypt. But at the same time, I don't have much hopes for this coming uh, elections. And as for me and as for my comrades in the socialist movement, we will be boycotting uh, those elections because they are happening as the army generals are still in charge. They are happening as the emergency law is still in charge or in effect. Um, um, but at the same time, the Internet will continue to be one of our weapons when it comes to the spread of information and when it comes to naming and shaming the abusers. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Sir. Thanks a lot. What do you mean by propaganda and professionalism as, as means to, to survive as a journalist in China? Yeah, because uh, in Western countries, people only regard the media as kind of a, a, a counter power of the state, right? People think the media should be really monitor what the government did. But in China, it's a little different. Media itself is a propaganda machine. It's war, at least worse, propaganda machine. Media in China is not only a news reporting thing, but also it's kind of a information control, not only to the government, but also not only to the individuals, citizens, but also to the local government. For example, we have the CCTV, national TV station. Part of the job is to report local corruption because central government want to really control the local government. The media, national media, will be convenient branch of the government. So before, media is a convenient, is a branch of the government. So it's not about freedom of speech or freedom of press. It's privilege of the media. In 2000, after 2000, in the year of 2000, me, Chinese became more and more into a, a, a media society. The media only that depend on the readership, not on the party. Party didn't give money anymore to the most of the media. So most of the people, you know, turns out to really to look works as look like a Western journalist. But still, the structure exists. We have central government. We have local government. So if you are Beijing reporter, you have a national report, central reporter. You report local corruption. That'd be almost no problem for you. You can easily do. So that's why the best newspapers was either in Beijing or in Guangdong. It's a very remote and near Hong Kong, which is a more free province. But another, they're also in Beijing, because Beijing is a central reporter. They, they fear they have the freedom and privilege to report local way. And also, we call it cross provinces criticism. A Guangdong province can criticize other provinces, but they don't criticize themselves. So because China has the central and province structure, so they give the Chinese reporters a little bit of space, can report freely on corruption in the local level, which in the China, we have almost no freedom of speech. But still, we reporters bravely report the corruption, look like a Western journalist. That because the political structure create a similar space for journalists. That's what I, what I mentioned. People want to, journalists also utilize that structure to work for their career, for their, their pursuit of the freedom of speech. 
Do you think that uh, in a certain way the Chinese government is going to uh, accept uh, in um, more and more uh, Google or the social networks or do you think that uh, it's going to uh, use them or, or, or maybe to have a struggle with them? Ch Chinese national policy to the Web 2.0 is very simple and easy. First, to have Chinese copycat of the every Web 2.0 services. You have Facebook, we have Renren. You have YouTube, we have Youku. You have Google, we have Baidu. You have Twitter, we have Weibo. We almost have every, everything Chinese way. The second step, block the international site. So Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google, they blocked. So that was the policy come from. The, the, the very simple idea. People need social network. People need social media. But also, the party don't want the Tunisia and Egypt to happen in China. So the crucial for them to keep the server in their hand. That comes out, Chinese social networking. Every server is in Beijing. So it first satisfied the, re the, the users. Users now in China can have the social networking. But also, it also satisfy it also satis satisfy the, the, the government. Government is scared of the people use the social network as a protest tool. But if you keep the server in the government's hand, I don't think the protest that happen. Yeah, so that's the policy. So in this case, they just uh, copy the same never, same policy again and again and again. But very crucial is uh, you both satisfy the government and the, re uh, the users. Do you believe that we may see a certain kind of convergence between uh, the needs of uh, a developing country as China is and uh, the aim for, uh, as you said before, more information about uh, uh, topics as corruption uh, at a um, regional but also at a national level? Do you think that we could have a convergence? Uh, yeah, I think definitely so Chinese social networking already become a national platform of the political debate if the debate is not so sensitive. They censor another part of the politic debate, but, but a lot of the debate is still going on in Chinese. When China everyday netizens get used to this kind of debate, eventually you think it is born right. You, you should do that. It's not like importing privilege about West. It's not like a West democracy. It's our born, born right of freedom of speech. When people get used to that free thinking, for at least free talking, even it's not politically, but about social issues, still you can hear Chinese to, 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 to have a new mindset of the information freedom, which is definitely healthy for the civil society. I see no radical change of a political way, but I do think China will get a more civil society, healthy civil society.